Okay, we are recording, so we're good to go on that score. Um, if you remember nothing else from yesterday, remember that the electric potential of a point charge is KQ over R. So um, we use a capital V for electric potential. I don't know if I've ever had a class where we used anything but that for electric potential. Um, often in graduate school, we ended up using different letters than I was accustomed to, but maybe not for that. Um, and there's an assumption for this that the electric potential at infinity is defined to be zero. And much of the time that's a, an assumption that will be unstated, but it's just one that we'll use. So if you're ever asked, calculate the electric potential at such and such a point for a particular charge distribution, the assumption will always be that it's defined to be zero at infinity and infin infinite distance here. So here's one charge. And this is easy to calculate, um, just plug and chug on something like that. For multiple charges, it's not much worse. It's just V is gonna be the sum from I equal one to however many charges you happen to have of K Q sub I over R sub I. And so uh, for something like that, grab another piece of scratch paper. Try to keep the, the large ones clean for a while. Um, you could imagine that you've got just a bunch of charges scattered around here and you're supposed to calculate the potential down here at point P. So this would be Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. And in each case, the R sub I that you're interested in is the just the distance to that particular charge. So, whoops, missed, um, R3, and so forth. And it's a scalar calculation. You don't have to worry about angles or anything else. It's only distances that show up in there. So that's what it happens to be for that. Now, I don't know that we'll get to one of these calculations today, but for a continuous charge distribution, you can probably imagine where we're going. Um, single fraction for that, a sum of fractions for that. So for a continuous charge distribution, the electric potential is going to be the integral of k dq over r. And dq is just going to be some little chunk of the charge distribution. r is going to be the distance from that little chunk to wherever you're calculating the electric potential. All of these are uh, you'll have to have stated where it is you're supposed to be calculating the electric potential because that matters. And all of these definitions assume that V equals zero at infinity. So if you can get an infinite distance away from this charge or these charges or this continuous charge distribution that the potential will be zero there. And then we had another um, definition that came out of that early stuff and that was for potential difference. And in that case, it's not for the absolute potential, it's just for the difference between two points. So it might be like um, VB minus VA 
and it's when you know the electric field that exists in space, then the potential difference between two points will be the integral from the negative of the integral from a to b of e dot ds. And ds is just a little length of a line. Turns out that um, electric potential or the electric force is a conservative force. And what that means is it's a force where the potential difference between two points is independent of the path taken. So uh, for this integral, there's not necessarily a defined path, but you can pick one that's convenient and you should get the same value no matter what you happen to use for the path. So, um, and that's, if you know the electric field, then you can calculate the potential difference between two points. And yesterday we looked at a situation where um, we had a uniform electric field and if that's the case, then the potential difference just ends up being ED, the distance between the two points, if you're moving along the electric field line or parallel to it. Uh, so those are things that we used uh, yesterday. But today we're going to just use some things that may at time take advantage of this. Other times it may seem like, why are we doing this in this chapter? and stuff like that, but uh, we'll see where they go. First one, we have three point charges. Okay, that's going to sound sort of familiar. And uh, those are the values of them. They're located at the corners of a triangle whose sides are each nine centimeters long. So we have a an equilateral triangle here. And we can just imagine, doesn't much matter uh, which one we put there. If we call this one Q1, this one Q2, and this one Q3, and it doesn't actually matter where I stick which one because it's only magnitudes and distances that show up in this thing. And uh, There we have it. We want to know the electric potential at the center of the triangle. Hmm. Well, I'm guessing the center is going to be someplace like this, but I bet if I drew some lines on here and uh, these, I didn't draw a very equilateral triangle, but if that one makes it perpendicular to that side and this one doesn't look very per perpendicular, but if this is perpendicular to that side, and then if I manage to do something like this, um, if this one is perpendicular to that side, then the point where all those perpendiculars cross would be the center of the, of the thing. And if each side is a length, oh, let's call the length S of a side, something like that. Well, let's see, something I know about an equilateral triangle is that each of these angles is going to be 60 degrees and this will bisect it. So this one should be 30 degrees. And let's see, this will be one half S. And so I can figure out the hypotenuse of that thing, I think. Um, one half S divided by, let's see, I'll let uh, D be the distance from the center to one of those corner posts. So one half S divided by D is going to equal, looks like uh, cosine of 30 degrees, I think. Catch me if I make a mistake, but I, I think that's okay. So D the distance from any one of these charges to the center of that thing should equal S divided by two times the cosine of 30 degrees. So 
we've only got two significant figures on here, so I'll figure two significant, well, the angle is gonna be exact just because of the nature of it, but S is 9.0 centimeters, so, And hopefully I didn't make a mistake on that little bit of math there, but uh, Uh, and I get three square roots of three, or about uh, 5.2 centimeters. All right, so that's how far away it is. Now, the electric potential in that case, with the assumption that the electric potential, if you get infinitely far away from this, it's going to be zero, would just be um, actually kq1 over d plus kq2 over d plus kq3 over d <clears throat> and k over d is the same for all of these it's just going to be k over d times the net charge in this case <coughs> excuse me um the net charge is they're all microcoulombs. Eight and five is 13 minus three is 10 microcoulombs. So that's the net charge. So electric potential there, I'll just plug in the numbers now. Uh, 8.99, the usual. I should get or write these down because <clears throat> you may not be familiar with them yet, but times 10 times 10 to the minus 6th coulombs and then 5.2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. Unit wise, Newton meter squared divided by meters will give me Newton meters, which are joules. And 1 over Coulomb squared times a Coulomb is 1 over a Coulomb. So I'll have joules per Coulomb or volts. So V is going to be whatever that answer comes out to be. <clears throat> Wow, this is a lot. Maybe those charges aren't so small. Micro coulombs, um, they're pretty close together. I get about 1.7 times 10 to the sixth if I didn't make a mistake. Um, let's see, nine times 10, that's 90 divided by five is about 18 or probably 1.7. Um, and then 10 to the ninth, that's 10 to the third, 10 to the fifth. Yeah, that makes sense that it's that big. That's a lot. Oh, and units on here, volts. <laughs> so this V stands for the electric potential. This V stands for the units of the electrical potential. And that's just one of those things. Maybe we could put a a VC sub C on this thing for the potential at the center of that triangle. And then it might make be a little bit less confusing. Now, part B says to calculate the electric potential energy of this arrangement. Well, remember potential energy for two charges looked like K Q1 Q2 over R12. And in this case, we've actually got three pairs of things. Uh, this pair, this pair, and this pair. 
that we'll have to think about. So I'm just going to cross this. Well, actually that one works out, but I have to add in the other ones. So I'd also have K Q1 Q3 over R13 plus K Q2 Q3 over R23. Now in every case the R12, R13 and R23 is the length of the side S which is 9.0 centimeters and so that's a little bit rep repetitious. So I could write this as the potential energy of this whole batch of charges is K over, um, I'll just call it S because it's the length of the side. And then just those those things. And 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per coulomb squared divided by S which is 9.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. And actually that divides and becomes Something like nine times 10 or one times 10 to the 11th, I think, but it'd be joules per coulomb squared. And then I'm going to multiply these in my head, I think. Um, eight times negative three is negative 24. And that'd be times 10 to the minus 12th coulomb squared because a micro times a micro is a micro squared. So minus 24, um, this one times this one is plus 40. And I'll put the units outside the parentheses here. Probably not a good practice. And minus 15. And then times 10 to the minus 12th Coulomb squared. I think is what we get on that thing. Um, let's see, negative 24, 40, and minus 15. So I think that ends up being one. As near as I can tell, um, 16 minus 15 is one. So one times 10 to the minus 12th Coulomb squared. So that Coulomb squared takes care of those Coulomb squared. Newton meter squared over um, meters is just Newton meters. It's just going to be joules for the units on here. And I'm pretty sure, let's see, that's 1 times 10 to the 11th times 1 times 10 to the minus 12th is 1 times 10 to the minus 1. Check that with your calculator if you want to, but um, I think I would get about 0 0.10 or whatever 8.99 divided by 9 happens to be. which is probably pretty close to, yeah, to two sig figs, it's 1.0. So 0 0.10 joules is all that thing works out to. Um, we're not going to do anything worse than this. Uh, three charges is enough. You get three pairs out of that one. But uh, as soon as you get to four and beyond, it starts getting complicated. It's like playing cribbage with four pairs. I don't know if that even shows up in cribbage, but I bet it could sometime. Okay. Anyway, there's one. That wasn't too bad. Um, here's a place where we happen to have an expression for the electric field. I've already posted these ones up on the Canvas page, by the way. Um, an electric field in a certain region of space is given by E equals alpha x along i hat and the potential at x equals 5 centimeters is 100 volts and the potential at x equals 95 centimeters is 500 volts 
use that information to find the value of alpha. Okay, so alpha is presumably a constant. So, hmm, this sounds like a good opportunity to use that expression delta v is the negative of the integral of e dot ds. So let's see what we can do with that here. And I'm gonna imagine that I've got some imaginary path that I can take through space here. Okay, so there's my path right here is, um, I'll let this be the x direction. So here's five centimeters in the x direction. And then out here is 95 centimeters. And it says the electric field is alpha x along i hat throughout this space. So I'm going to integrate from five centimeters to 95 centimeters and I'll get delta V equaling V of 95 minus V of five. And it'll be the negative of the integral of E dot. In this case, for DS, I'm just gonna be integrating along the X axis. So I would get, instead of DS, I'll have DX and it happens to be in the I hat direction. And then E is that thing. So I happen to know each of these things. This one is 500 volts. This one is 100 volts. And so equals the negative of alpha x along i hat dotted with dx along i hat. And I'm going from um, 5.00 times, well, I don't know how precisely these positions are measured. I'll go with two sig figs. So call it 5.0 times 10 to the minus two meters, two. Uh, 9 point or 95, excuse me, 95 times 10 to the minus two meters. And that's what I have. Uh, that's sloppy, but we'll fix that on the next go around. Um, I hat dot I hat is one. Again, I hope that's sticking in your head now. The alpha is a constant, so I can pull it outside the integral and inside I'll just have x dx. So this integral will turn into minus alpha times the integral from 5.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters to 95 times 10 to the minus 2 meters of x dx is what's left in there, which ends up being 1 half x squared. So on the left side, I'll have 400 volts is equal to minus, this will be 1 half x squared, so I'll write it as 1 half alpha x squared evaluated at 5.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters and 95 times 10 to the minus 2 meters, which ends up being, actually, yeah, I may as well evaluate that thing, um, minus 1 half alpha times, I think this one's going to win, Oh, I forgot. Let's see.
So I get about 0 0.90. meters squared for the subtraction of those two things. So looks to me like alpha is negative, which makes sense if you think about it. If moving in this direction, you're moving toward increasing potential, you must be moving against the electric field because the electric field points effectively downhill toward decreasing potential. And that's something that's nice to remember. Um, so if going from this point, which is at 100 centimeters or 100 volts, to this point, which is at 500 volts, we must be going opposite the electric field. And so that's what tells us that. So then alpha, just solving for that, will equal minus two times 400 volts divided by 0 0.90 meters squared. And so alpha is gonna have a negative value of 8.9 if we keep two significant figures times 10 squared and the units for alpha will be volts per meter squared. So there we have it. Or let's see, since a volt is a Newton meter per coulomb, yeah, let's just leave it the way it is. Uh, volt per meter squared is good enough. All right, and the minus sign tells us that the electric field actually points that way. But we could have intuited that. I think that's a word. Anyway, we could have figured that out by intuition, knowing that if the potential increases that way, the electric field must point that way. I don't hear that word intuited very often, so it wasn't positive. Okay, here's one that's kind of different. Uh, we have two charged spherical conductors connected by a long conducting wire. And this is gonna partly relate back to something that um, I talked about in relation to Gauss's law. So these things are connected by this long conducting wire and a total charge of 20 microcoulombs is placed on this combination of the two spheres. If one has a radius of four centimeters and the other has a radius of six centimeters, what's the electric field near the surface of each sphere? Hmm. Well, how in the world are we supposed to figure that out? Um, time for a piece of scratch paper, probably. Let's see. If you remember, if you have a spherically symmetric charge distribution and it has a radius R, the electric field outside of that thing will have a magnitude of just outside of it or on the surface will have a if this has a charge Q evenly distributed over the thing, an electric field of KQ over R squared. So that's the electric field there. <clears throat> the electric potential of that charge distribution is going to be just K capital Q over R. And so those are a couple things that we know. Now, if you've got a sphere like this here, and we can call this R sub four for the four centimeter radius sphere, and then a long ways away from that thing is, whoops, the larger of the two spheres. So this will have a radius of six centimeters. I guess I didn't 
<laughs> draw it bigger, but that's okay. And they're connected by a long wire. Now, in an electrostatic situation, which is what this thing ends up being within a very short time of you connecting these things by the wire, the electric field, they're spherical conductors. The electric fields within the conductors themselves will be zero. And within this wire, the electric field will be zero. And so what that means is the potential difference between these two things, which is minus the integral of E dot dS, and you can pick any path on which to uh, integrate this thing, but it'll be zero because a path we could take from this conductor to that one is going to be stay within the conducting wire. The electric field is going to be zero everywhere within that. And so that means both of these two spheres are at the same electric potential. Now, if you dumped a bunch of charge onto conductors, that charge opposites attract, but like charges repel, those charges will spread out as far apart as they possibly can. And the best way for them to do that is to put themselves onto the surface of each of these spheres, evenly distributed there. The wire's gonna screw things up a little bit, but, uh, We'll ignore that, the screwing up that the wire does for the nice symmetry that you have on there. So both spheres are at the same potential. The potential of a charged sphere is something like that. And so what we can say is that using that, um, the K Q on the four centimeter radius sphere divided by that radius, R4, is going to equal the KQ on the six centimeter sphere divided by that radius of the six centimeter sphere. And now here we've got two unknowns. We don't know Q4 and we don't know Q6, but we do know that Q4 plus Q6 is equal to 20 microcoulombs. And so uh, with those two equations, we've got enough information to try to figure this thing out. For instance, um, the Ks go away. We don't even have to worry about them. We could say that um, Q4 over R4 is equal to Q6 over R6, or you could say stuff like um, Q4 is going to equal R4 over R6 times Q6. Well, this ends up being two thirds. So, and so then I can just take that value of Q4 and plug it into here, then I'll get um, two thirds Q6 plus Q6 is equal to 20 microcoulombs. And that looks to me like uh, five thirds Q6. Or Q6 is gonna be three fifths of that which looks like 12 microcoulombs to me. And that means Q4, which is two thirds of that, is going to be eight microcoulombs. So that's how we can figure those things out. And that wasn't too bad. That was actually, especially the mathematics of it, once you realize that the electric potentials of the two things had to be the same. Now, the actual electric potential of each sphere, doesn't matter which one we pick, but um, the electric potential of the four centimeter radius one is going to be K times 
Q4. I'll just write the letters here, but um, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. And we don't have much in the way of sig figs on here, probably one when we're done. Um, eight times 10 to the minus six Coulombs and four times 10 to the minus two meters. Okay, we'll end up with Newton meters per Coulomb, joules per Coulomb or volts. And if we use the, the uh, six centimeter one, we'd have a 12 up here and a six on the bottom. And that division is two as is eight divided by four. So they're both gonna be the same. And so, And I get about, uh, well, to two significant figures, it's 1.8 capital MV megavolts. 1.8 times 10 to the 6 volts is what it ends up being, which is a lot, actually. So... Got that. Let's see. What's the electric field strength? then E is equal to, for a spherically symmetric distribution like this, it's KQ over R squared. It's actually V divided by R. And if I take that 1.8 megavolts and divide it by four times 10 to the minus two meters, I end up with 45 times 10 to the seventh volts per meter. Okay, the breakdown strength of air is three times 10 to the sixth volts per meter. I just read that this morning. And so this is greater than the breakdown, breakdown strength of air, that electric field strength. So uh, you couldn't put that much charge on that small of a sphere if you're doing this in air. If you go to the moon, you might be able to pull it off but uh, where you've got a vacuum. But here, the electric field strength near the surface of each of these spheres is going to be enough that um, it'll separate the charges, pull the electrons off the air atoms, and uh, you just get sparks coming off of these spheres, which is charge leaking off of it. So not going to be possible. Okay, and here's a one that actually addresses that. Uh, it asks the question, can a conducting sphere 10 centimeters in radius hold a charge of four microcoulombs in air without breakdown? So Let's figure it out. The electric field strength in this case is going to be KQ over R squared. And let's see, R is 10 centimeters, 4 times 10 to the minus 6. So we'll have the 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. In this case, we might just round it to 9, but or 9.0. Uh, let's see, the amount of charge they were wondering about is 4 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, and then divide by 10 centimeters, 0 0.10 meters. I'm guessing maybe it's got two sig figs, but who knows? Probably doesn't. We'll round this down to one sig fig when we're done here. So, shoot, 
should have been able to do this in my head. Um, four e e minus six. I'm not feeling sharp today, so. And I get um, 3.6 um, megavolts per meter unit wise. Um, and you can play around with the units and convince yourself of that. Remembering that a volt, one volt equals one Newton meter per coulomb. Um, you should be able to convince yourself of that. But anyway, this is stronger than the breakdown strength of air. So the answer to this question is no. Okay, so what is the maximum charge that you can put on a sphere of radius five centimeters? Well, to figure that out, you just set up the equation kq over, in this case, it's r sub 5 squared, where the r sub 5 is the 5 centimeters, and that will equal 3 times 10 to the 6th volts per meter. So we set the electric field equal to the breakdown strength of air, and then just imagine using a smidgen less charge than what we'll end up with. So the Q in this case will equal three times 10 to the sixth volts per meter times five times 10 to the minus two meters squared. That will give me volt times meters. And then divide by I'll just do nine here times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Okay, unit wise, this is going to be a little bit scary, but uh, the numerator volts per meter times meter squared denominator is Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. So these go away. And I'll end up with a volt coulomb per uh, newton, I think. Oh, per newton meter. Um, yeah, because there's still a meter down there on the bottom. All right, well, a volt is a joule per coulomb or a newton meter per coulomb. The, oh, let's see. Oh, this was a coulomb squared on top. Okay. Yeah, this is a joule or a newton meter per coulomb. Okay, I do end up with coulombs. That's good. Just had to convince myself. Um, again, that volt is a... Newton meter per coulomb. So times coulomb squared divided by Newton meters. And that's how I end up with coulombs. Can we do this in our heads? Three times five is 15 divided by nine is about 1.7, something like that. Let's see, 10 to the six. Oh wait, that's a 15 or 25. Nope, not doing it in my head. I got about eight times 10 to the minus seventh coulombs. So for that, so that's the maximum charge, 0.8 micro coulombs on a sphere of radius five centimeters. And if you try to put more on it than that, then you'll have charge leaking off of it. So that wasn't too bad, was it? I hope. Did I do anything you didn't quite follow? Um, this is one that uh, I'm going to see if I can 
track this down, but um, I used to uh, have the students do this in a, a lab, and it was an, an Excel lab where we would um, make three-dimensional plots in Microsoft Excel and of the electric potential of just a couple of point charges. And it was kind of neat to uh, look at them. And they'd look like, uh, well, in two dimensions, if you had like, say, a positive charge here, and we would just imagine that the charge was like plus one or something like this, and then a charge over here that was minus three. And if you just made a one dimensional plot of the electric potential of something like this, uh, with that KQ over R being the potential of a point charge, as you get close to either one of these things, the effect of the other charge kind of vanishes on you. And so um, very close to these, what dominates is the one over R of the thing. And what you'd find out is that um, as you get very close to either charge for this positive charge, the electric potential would go toward plus infinity. And so kind of looks like that's supposed to be symmetric. For this negative charge here, the electric potential would go toward minus infinity, but it goes toward minus infinity faster than it goes toward the other one. And actually, if you get far enough to the left, this group of two charges will look like a charge of minus two, and so you'll actually have the electric potential dropping below zero here somewhere. But then it, it um, has to cross somewhere between the two charges, and so it would be something like this, and you could actually calculate where that would be. In fact, for this one, we'll particular problem will do that. But the neat thing that you could used to be able to do in Excel is you could make this three-dimensional and so you could see how it varied coming toward you and going into the page from this thing and this feature that they used to have in Excel that they dropped back in about 2010 or so, maybe it was 2007, I can't remember. But you could use your mouse cursor and grab a corner of this three-dimensional plot and drag it and look at these plots from different directions. And that was a neat feature. But uh, this problem is going to be a, a more static representation of the thing. We imagine that we have a charge of minus three nanocoulombs located at the origin of a coordinate system. So well, let's draw our x-axis and uh, see what we get here. Okay, so here's the origin right there. And at that spot, we put a minus 3 nanocoulomb charge. And then... Out here at two meters, we put a charge of eight nanocoulombs. Okay. And then the question is at what two locations on the x axis is the electric potential equal to zero? Hmm. Okay, well, I bet there's going to be some place between these two charges where that's the case because the electric potential very near this negative three nanocoulomb charge is going to head toward infinity. Okay, so it's going to do something like this on either side of it. The electric or the uh, electric potential, I should have said potential, I'm not sure if I said field or not, but the electric potential of this positive charge is going to head toward infinity as you're very close to it. And so it'll do something like that. So in between these two things, somewhere, it's going to have to be zero. It'll have to cross through. 
And because this is a bigger charge than this charge, I would think that it's not going to be midway between the two, but it's going to be a little bit closer to that. And then um, out here to the right of this, um, as you go far and far away from these things, because this is a bigger charge, way out on the x-axis, you'll be mainly experiencing five nanocoulombs worth of charge. And so the electric potential will probably stay positive everywhere to the right. But over here, as you get way to the left of this one, um, very far away, still looking back, you'd see a plus five nanocoulomb charge. So somewhere far to the left of this, the electric potential will probably go positive again. And the trick is to write down an expression for the electric potential in between these two points and then somewhere far to the left of those two points that will be correct for particular values of x. And so I'll try the one in between here. So um, for zero is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to two meters, the total electric potential would be, I'll call this one Q1 so I don't have to write it down again, <laughs> and call this one Q2, it'll equal KQ1 over, well, let's just pick a point here, call this X, and X will be the distance from zero to a point in between here. So that'll be just fine. Then I'll also have KQ2, but what I want is the distance from this thing to this, which the distance will be two meters minus X. And try to wrap your head around that. Distances are always positive, and so um, I need to do this subtraction in the correct order so that I get a positive value out of this. Remember, this is only in the region from zero to two meters that this is going to be the case. So uh, that'll work out. And so I want this to be zero. Well, first thing I can do is cross out the k's because they're not going to affect this any. And the point in between the two, if I kick this across, I can say q1 over x, uh, let's see, will equal minus q2 over 2 meters minus x, or if I multiply both sides by negative one, I will get minus Q1 over X. And I did that because Q1 happens to be negative, it is gonna equal Q2 over two meters minus X. And then I wanna know what X is. So uh, this one is, Let's see, negative three nanocoulombs, but when I take the negative of it, I get three nanocoulombs times two meters minus X is gonna equal, Q2 is eight nanocoulombs times X. And by the way, I, um, I just cross multiplied on here. Now, Nanocoulombs show up on both sides, so I'm just going to cross those out. Uh, I can divide them out. And 3 times 2 meters minus x is going to be 6 meters minus 3x is going to equal 8x. Or uh, add 3x to both sides, and I'll get 6 meters is going to equal 11x. Or x will equal 6 elevenths of 
a meter, okay, which is kind of an odd multiple, but uh, we don't have tons of sig figs on here, but it would be about um, whatever six divided by 11 happens to be. Uh, about 55 centimeters is about what it ends up being. So, um, yeah, this eight positive eight nanocoulombs does kind of dominate. The zero crossover point here is only a little more than half a meter away from that smaller charge. And so, and that's where it actually crosses over. Now, um, for the region from, uh, for X less than zero, Okay, again, we're going to want distances here, but uh, I'll have the electric potential equaling KQ1. Now, to the left of there, X is negative, but I want the distance, and it's the negative of X that will give me the distance to charge Q1. And then plus KQ2. Turns out, uh, if you've got a point over here, two meters minus X will do it again, because it's going to be two meters back to the origin, and then plus the negative of X, the negative of X will be the distance from here to here. So two meters minus X does it again. And if you want to know where this thing will equal zero, you set it equal to zero and then start sticking the stuff in here. Uh, Q1, because it's negative, um, the negative over the negative will give you a just KQ1 over X. But you can play around with that and see where it happens to come out equal to zero. This is kind of tricky that you have to set up a different expression for the electric potential depending on where you happen to be. Um, but that's what you have to do to get the, the distance correct on that thing. So that's how you would do one like that. Oh, we're about out of time today. That's okay. Um, this one that we'll do tomorrow, we'll start with this one tomorrow. And uh, they do this as an example in the book, but it's, it's an easy integral to do. And uh, we'll do this calculation tomorrow that uh, a ring of radius R with a total charge Q spread uniformly over its perimeter. And what's the potential difference between the point at the center of the ring and a point on the axis of the ring to R from the center? So, a little more challenging problem, and we'll take that on tomorrow. Okay, um, looks like I got through the, the day without having anything crash. Things seem to be working well on this computer, and I'm zeroing in on the problems my other computer has, checking out the memory card one at a time. Anyway, uh, any questions that popped up from those things today? Read chapter 23. 23. Yeah, we're in chapter 23 because it um, just gives you so much more background knowledge on the ideas of electric potential and things like that. So take that on. Um, this week's lab is going to be doing some things with your little electronics kits. And I may be able to get that posted tonight. So um, we'll see how that goes. It's going to be a fairly elementary lab, but uh, exploring the resistance measurements with your, with your things. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow.